there are a bunch of publicly available university courses on the internet that you can take for free. In this video, Seth Golden and Sam Crombie will teach you how to find the best course for you and how to get the most out of the courses you take. Welcome to our video course on learning from free public college computer science courses on the web. This video is a collaboration between College Compendium and the amazing Free Code Camp. I'm Seth Golden, and together with Samuel Crombie, we've put together this course helping you to be successful within self-guided education. We're going to dive deep into the autodidactic nature of learning on the internet, learning from public courses, and why you should consider trying it. We'll discuss choosing a topic and a course to learn about that topic, and then making the most of your experience. And then at the end, we have a couple of vlogs where we review real courses and discuss our thoughts. This video is broken into chapters that you can skip to if you're interested in a specific section. If you prefer to read, we will have a brief written accompanying article available on Free Code Camp. Before I end this introduction, I encourage you to check out College Compendium sometime during or after finishing this video. College Compendium is a free, nonprofit, open source compilation of over a thousand public university computer science courses from awesome colleges across North America. You can also access public textbooks as complimentary material on the site, collegecompendium.org. We hope that the resources available there and this video are helpful to you. Are you excited to begin? By the end of this video, you'll be prepared to audit courses on the web and succeed in them. Hi everyone, my name is Sam and alongside Seth, in this uh, series of videos, I'm going to be talking about how to audit college courses. Now, in this section, before we even dive into what that actually means, I wanna take a step back and talk about learning on the internet. And taking even another step back, talking about learning, what is learning? Well, Merriam-Webster defines learning as the activity or process of gaining new knowledge or skill by studying, practicing, being taught, or experiencing something. So you wake up and stub your toe getting out of bed, you've learned something new. You go forage for berries or, I don't know, eat raw meat, and then you get sick, boom, you've learned. And so, like, as humans, learning is us being awake and conscious, and as we experience new things, we store that information and reference it later so that we can get smarter. And over time, as societies kind of developed, institutions popped up to formalize this learning in a setting that was helpful to that society. And so when we think about today, what it means to learn through an institution, over 99% of people born in 2022 are going to be learning up until at least primary school in some sort of formal government mandated environment, which means that if you're watching this video, you've most likely experienced this in one form or another. And so you'll be familiar with some of the characteristics of what it means to learn through an institution. First, structure. You go to the same place every day, you interact with the same people, the same teachers, and barring differences in semesters or years, it's really something that has been well thought out and is very consistent in terms of what you're learning, how you're learning it, where you're learning it. It stays the same. Two, there's a lot of sequence in how you learn in that what you've previously learned, what you're currently learning, and what you are going to learn has again been really well thought out. And there's an order that makes sense so that your knowledge compounds on top of itself over time. Three, this institutional learning is compulsory in that you don't really have to ask yourself, why am I learning? You know, really the answer is because you have to. Um, there's nothing very philosophical about it, otherwise you're breaking the law or your guardians are breaking the law. So the incentives are you have to do it. And fourth, because you are in person or interacting with peers and professors and buildings and different things, um, especially in uh, topic areas like hard sciences where you have to interact with something, it's very experiential. And so learning through institutions is one type of learning. And a distinct form of learning that isn't mutually exclusive but is different is autodidactic learning, where a lot of these questions that are answered for you when learning through an institution are solved in that determining the topic you study, where you're studying it, when you study it, and how you study it, those are all questions that you actually have to answer for yourself. And 
whether you know it or not, you've probably engaged in kind of self-guided learning at some point in your life. And it's not a new concept, it's something that people have done for quite a long time. And in fact, some of our greatest minds have been autodidactic learners learning outside of a formal institution. So it's distinct from learning in a school because there's a lot more flexibility in terms of spatially not having to be in a location, in terms of the content you learn, the form of content, the type of content you learn. There's a lot more flexibility in general. Two, the learning is most often non-sequential in that you don't have someone telling you you need to learn this in ABC order. It's really up to you, and that can be very difficult. Three, there are other incentives um, for self-guided autodidactic learning because there isn't someone telling you you have to go to school. You have to really think about why am I wanting to learn this. It's a different incentive model. And ultimately, you may be engaging with friends who are also learning alongside you, and you may be engaging with you know an expert or an instructor, but ultimately it's an independent activity as compared to learning in a formal institution. And when you think about the barriers to entry when it comes to time and cost of autodidactic learning on the internet, it can be really steep. Because again, in a learning environment where you're in an institution, those questions are being answered for you for the most part. So when you're learning in an autodidactic manner, you're answering the questions of what do I want to learn? Why do I want to learn it? When and how do I learn it? Are there prerequisites for what I'm learning? Are the resources that I'm using trustworthy, accurate? How am I going to stay on schedule? How am I going to stay motivated? How am I going to stay engaged? And again, autodidactic learning and learning through institutions, there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of similarities, but a lot of the questions that are answered in a formal environment aren't answered for you when you're learning on your own. And it's a shame that this is so difficult and that so few people are able to really kind of figure it out because there are so many great resources on the internet that really any topic at any skill level has quite a bit of supporting material. And so you have autodidactic learning, you have learning through institutions. These are two distinct things, but they're also two very similar things. And so it's not a matter of going to school or dropping out. In fact, it's a matter of how do we take what learning through an institution can provide us in terms of what it's figured out for how to most effectively learn and apply that to autodidactic learning and self-guided study. And we'll talk about later why we've chosen auditing college courses as a way of thinking about learning on the internet. But as a little precursor, the answer is because when you are learning through one of these courses that's available, um, particularly when it comes to computer science courses, it has a lot of structure and similarity to what you would learn in a school. And so it's a great entry point into learning on the web, this huge umbrella of how do I learn on the internet? And we believe that if you learn how to learn on the internet, you can really reach any goal on any topic at any place. And so that's what we're going to be establishing in this course and talking about going forward, learning, learning on the internet, and now this process of autodidactic learning, how do you formalize that and how do you get better at it and how do you apply it to something like auditing? So in the next section, Seth is going to talk about what it means to audit a course. Now that we've talked about autodidacticism and discussed a broad overview of learning on the web, what does it mean to audit a course? In the American university system, Auditing is when you take a course offered by an institution for no credit or grade. This primarily encompasses attending lectures without participating in examinations and an effort to learn more about a particular topic. Depending on the institution or platform, you're able to access assignments or projects to work on independently without receiving feedback. Auditing a class may also require official instructor permission. In an online format, Auditing a class usually entails having access to lecture videos, notes, and or previous assignments. In other words, a complete outline of the course without the personalized interaction with professors, teaching assistants, lab instructors, or other students. Online communities can be a substitute for such traditional class support. We encourage you to explore methods of engaging with other learners, some of which we'll discuss later. But first, some background. 
Auditing classes has long been an option for students enrolled at an educational institution to potentially forgo paying or receiving a grade for a class, whether because of time, financial constraints, or difficulty of course material. Since the inception of the internet, auditing university courses has appeared in multiple forms. One of the earliest examples of a formalized, institution-supported platform for taking online courses was MIT's OpenCourseWare, which has operated since 2002 and posted hundreds of variations of their courses to audit. Other public platforms have also supported this mission and posted their material for free. More recently, Coursera was built as a premium version of this type of auditing, in some circumstances providing a more formal education closer to an accredited degree. College Compendium is another free resource that you can take advantage of to find free public class resources. There are many such resources, including dozens of amazing GitHub repositories compiling computer science courses. It may often seem that when comparing your options for learning on the web, you're choosing between a structured or a customizable curriculum. With an organized curriculum, you always know what you're supposed to do next. You can be confident that someone who likely has a strong understanding of the material that you aim to learn has taken the time to arrange the order of your learning in a beneficial way. Alternatively, the benefit of choosing a customizable curriculum to learn from several disparate resources in the order of your choice has the benefit of being well-suited to your personal needs and learning style. However, combining resources can also cause overlapping redundant learning, as well as perhaps a less comprehensive overview of your material. Auditing courses on the web is a great resource for the intellectually curious that provides a cost-conscious, low-risk, organized format for academic exploration that has the benefit of being inexpensive or free as opposed to boot camps, online degree programs, and certifications, and structured compared to navigating videos, blogs, and informational articles. Through auditing, you gain the benefits of both an organized college curriculum with the ability to customize your learning to your needs, combining aspects of each format for online learning to negate the drawbacks of both. Auditing is an amazing option if you're serious about learning something new while being conscious about your time and cost constraints. Auditing can also be more specialized since expensive boot camps or courses on the other end of the spectrum are often limited in number and scope or built for training and vocational purposes. Specifically, learning from college computer science courses on the web may expose you to purely academic material, including more theoretical and low-level programming concepts. For example, a YouTube tutorial may teach you how to build a Python game, but it might not dive quite as deep into the details regarding how the underlying code functions. You must decide and choose for yourself the level of understanding that you're comfortable with. I find that I'm happier when I understand the underlying processes powering the code that I'm working with. And so when learning about neural networks, for example, I might audit a basic linear algebra course before tackling GANs. Auditing is just one component of an ecosystem of resources on the web that exist to help people learn at no cost. Many of these resources complement one another and are used interchangeably by platforms and courses supplementarily, such as much of the content on Free Code Camp. There's a lot of goodwill in open source online learning supporting making curriculums better and improving the availability of information. Now that I've given an overview of auditing, in our next section, we'll discuss why you should consider trying it. All right, so now that we know what it actually means to audit a college course, let's kind of summarize the last two lessons and think about why are we telling you all of this. So first, we talked about structured learning versus autodidactic self-guided learning. And we talked about how the internet is really the greatest resource for self-guided learning and how if you can learn how to learn, you can be like crazy powerful. And in the previous lesson, Seth talked about what it actually means to audit a course on the internet. And so the question is, bridging those two together, why? Like, why are we talking about auditing college courses within the context of all of these different learning opportunities on the internet? And so our idea is that auditing college courses is a great medium for getting comfortable with more self-guided learning because when it comes to auditing college courses, it's not nearly as easy as what it would be being in school, but it's also not nearly as difficult as I don't know what's out there, you know, what's the content, what am I even doing here? So really, auditing college courses is bridging 
formal education with this self-guided learning. Because when you're auditing college courses, you have the benefit of a few things. You have structured curriculum that is produced by an accredited institution, great institutions. You have a major selection of content that you can choose from, and it's free to use. So when you think about learning in the structured way, you have this structured curriculum that's laid out by the professor teaching the course, right? That's something we're familiar with. And it's produced by an accredited institution. Again, this is content that you know, going back to a few of those points about what it means to learn in a structured environment, you know that it's sequenced right, that the content is accurate, and that it's of good quality. On the other hand, looking towards the autodidactic side, you have so many different types of content you can choose from. There are so many different ways and time periods and places you can learn from, which is that flexibility, and it's free to use. So again, you're bridging self-guided learning and structured learning. So that's why we want to help you learn how to audit college courses on the internet. So again, thinking about you know why would I do this? Like what benefit do I have? Well, let's think about some examples. Let's say that you are a high school student or college student applying to a program and you are interested in that university or that institution. Well, what's a better way to get to know that institution than to take a course that's offered for free by that institution, exposing you to department, faculty, teaching style, different types of material covered, and I don't know, maybe you can build a relationship um, with the professors or some of the students who are also taking that course um, or who produce that course. So if you're interested in applying to, let's say, MIT, well, there's no better resource than MIT OpenCourseWare to get a sense of the different majors, the different content offered under the different majors, the learning style, and thinking about, is this a good place for me to go attend? But let's say that you're currently an enrolled student and maybe your program doesn't offer a certain type of content or a certain course or a certain topic. Well, this is another great way to uh, broaden your horizons and learn something that you otherwise wouldn't learn. So as an enrolled student, by auditing a college course, you can supplement your current courses. So maybe you know, you're know you really bad at linear algebra and so you need to go look at MIT OpenCourseWare's linear algebra course to supplement that. Maybe you're just generally interested in exploring different academic areas and you don't wanna pay for a class um, or your institution just doesn't offer it. And again, take more advanced courses than those that are offered at your school. So whether you are on the younger side and you have not uh, applied to a school or in school, it's a great way to learn about a school. If you are currently in school or you've graduated and you're just interested in supplementing um, something that you're learning, this is another great resource. Number three, young, slightly older, and now let's say you're 20 years into your career and you just hate it, you're absolutely loathe it, and you wanna change careers. Or maybe you do like your career, but you just wanna upskill because you wanna get a promotion. Well, auditing a college course is again, a really great resource for doing so because it's meritocratically making you a better candidate for positions or just generally giving you the skills uh, to switch careers. So if you're looking to upskill or change careers, you can explore new subject or career areas, uh, build context for exactly what you need to know and what you need to do to get a job, and ultimately stay competitive within your job or industry and reach any goals that you've set out to do. Now, it's getting old pretty quickly, um, no pun intended. There's a lot of use cases. And just generally, I think what a lot of people watching this video can relate to is this general use case of, you know, you're interested in learning something um, new just for fun, or you just want to freshen up on an old topic. And when you think about all of these courses out there, you can freshen up on so many skills or learn so many new skills. If you are a you know mid-career professional and maybe you're not up to date with the cool programs and uh, frameworks that the kids are using, you can un have better context for uh, what is being used in industry because it's usually followed um, concurrently in these courses. And so you can kind of get a refresher on what's new and what's exciting and just generally develop more advanced understanding of familiar topics. Those are four 
well thought out use cases and there are just so many more. I mean, there's so many reasons for why you want to take a college course, audit a college course. And I think that the overarching reason is that one, it's a great gap, it's a great bridge between this gap between structured learning and self-guided learning. And that is going to make you well-equipped going forward to learn on the internet just generally, however you do it. And this is a great way, it's a great introduction to learning on the internet. And really, the second takeaway is that whoever you are, wherever you are, there is going to be a great use case um, for why you should audit a college course. In the next section, Seth is going to help you think about what topic to choose. Are you excited to start learning on the web? First, we need to determine the topic you're most interested in expanding your knowledge on. What are you interested in? Why are you interested in that topic? What are you hoping to gain from learning about it? How excited are you about spending your free time learning your chosen topic? Did you choose the topic for independent study or is it a complement or component of an ongoing curriculum? Your answers will help you figure out what you wanna learn and why. Deciding on a topic to focus your attention on can be difficult. There are so many interesting things to learn, but that is one of the beauties of auditing. You can dip your toes into many different areas quickly and easily. And so picking a topic is a small commitment. If you're having trouble deciding between several, I'd consider which topics will be most useful in the short term or what you're the most curious about. On the other hand, if you're interested in auditing generally but struggling to find something you're passionate about studying, consider actionable content. Some of this plays into assessing your goals, which I'll discuss shortly, but it's a good idea to think about what draws you to online learning. Have you always wanted to learn how to build an app or a website or a game? Are you looking to expand your data science skills by learning about neural networks or support vector matrices? Are you trying to practice and improve your skills for coding interviews? These motivations should be reflected in the course that you ultimately decide to audit. Once you have a general idea of what you wanna learn about, acknowledging your skill level is also critical to picking the right course. Consider how much do you know about and how much exposure do you have to your topic of choice? Have you had formal instruction on this topic in the past? A lot of courses out there are inherently sorted by proficiency. Prerequisites, which themselves contain information within the scope of the topic, will help you identify where you will fall in terms of competence and where you should begin. For example, if you're coming from a beginning standpoint, maybe avoid auditing a graduate level course. Finally, as I brought up before, recognizing your goals is essential. Going into the course, contemplate what do you want to walk away with? Is there something specific you want to leave the course understanding? If the course is applied, what do you want to finish having built or having the capability to build? Are you aiming to build skills to pass an interview? If you can identify what you're working towards, you'll be more focused and more highly value your progress. I also want to note, however, that learning is just as much about the journey as it is about the destination. Reducing your audit to simply a list of checkboxes that you have to slog through to achieve your goals is a negative mindset that will cause you to have an inferior learning experience and potentially lead to some of the pitfalls I'll discuss in greater detail later. Let's bring together the three things I encourage you to assess, interests, skill level, and goals, and consider an example. Say I'm a student interested in app development with limited experience, but I have a project in mind I want to build a dating app for scientists called Radioactive Dating. Where should I start? App development is a broad area and I need to pick a particular topic for my course. For one thing, I'll have to decide what framework to learn. These days, there are many amazing options for app development. I could build valuable native development skills by picking up Swift or Kotlin, but then I'd have to compromise by only releasing the app on one platform. Alternatively, I could learn React Native or Ionic Angular to apply my existing stronger web dev skills to this project and achieve cross-platform compatibility, but with maybe slightly reduced app performance. Or I could even learn Dart-based Flutter and achieve similar native performance in a cross-platform code base, but at the cost of picking up a brand new framework with less support than either alternative. 
This example isn't meant to be a commentary on what the best app development framework is, because these are all great in different situations. But this is just one of many decisions I'm going to have to make in this scenario without knowing much about any of these options. And it's no small commitment either. So how should I go about doing it? Research is key. First, I should read any of the great articles on the web comparing and contrasting these frameworks to ensure that I'm making an informed decision before committing to learning a particular choice. Reading course descriptions and syllabi is also a great way to find out this information. I would also consider my background and my limitations. As an existing web developer with little time, Ionic, Angular, or React Native could be more desirable due to their familiarity and therefore quicker learning curve. Now that I've picked a topic, it's time to consider my skill level. Even though I know web development, I'm still a beginner when it comes to apps. So I'll start with something entry level. Choosing an introductory course for React Native rather than jumping into a higher level class will probably lead to a better experience. And if it is too easy, I can always move up. I now have determined my interest, React Native, my skill level, beginner, and my goal, a basic dating app. If some of these specific terms that I used in this example sound like a load of gibberish, don't worry. Making these decisions can quickly become complex with such a plethora of options. The best thing that you can do is make sure that you're informed about what you really want to be learning. You do not want to be a prospective data science student halfway through learning PHP before you realize it's maybe not quite the best tool for that interest. Here are some of the popular topics students have searched for on College Compendium. As you can see, Python is incredibly popular. Additionally, algorithms and data structures are close behind, which supports the idea that auditing can also help you gain a stronger understanding of fundamentals and foundational material. Learning from the web gives you the capability to choose whatever it is that you're fascinated by and focus on any aspect that interests you or that helps you fulfill your academic and professional goals. Assessing your interests, skill level, and goals will help you make this decision, but ultimately, choosing the right topic often comes down to a gut feeling of genuine excitement or strong motivation. I encourage you to experiment. The nice thing about having full control over your learning is that if at any time you decide you're more interested in another topic or another way of approaching the same topic, you can switch to that. Explore your options and indulge your curiosity. Being intentional about what you're looking to get out of your education can be extremely helpful in guiding your decisions and keep you motivated as you progress through your audit. Great. Now that you have a topic in mind and you've thought about how do I actually choose a topic to learn, we're going to talk about choosing the right class. Now, unless you're studying something super niche where there may only be one or two courses available on the internet to audit, there's a lot of benefit to really thinking thoroughly before you start a course about which course, which class is right for me to take on this topic. For example, for something like algorithms and computer science, there's a dozen or so courses on the internet that you can take. And there are differences between those courses. And, you know, a benefit of the internet is that you have the choice between those 12. And so really thinking about which one to take is super valuable. And that's what the section is going to talk about, how to choose the right class to audit. So first and foremost, you should be thinking about your learning type. And I think the way to think about this is to reflect on the best classes you've taken and what made them effective for you. Do you like lecturing? Do you like seminar style discussion? Uh, do you enjoy kind of getting a brief overview about a topic and diving in yourself? Do you like being guided thoroughly with examples by the professor? Um, thinking about what classes you've taken and exactly why they were effective for you is super helpful for thinking about the type of content you're going to be learning and what styles you're most accustomed to. Conversely, also thinking about which courses you've taken that you just hated and again, why that was. And you know, if it's about the content, that's one thing, but I think the important thing to reflect on is what you were doing in the classroom and what made it effective what made it ineffective, 
and considering that as you're choosing courses, because you'll see that, again, different professors, different universities, same topic, they teach a lot of this in very different ways, based on sequence, based on the explanation, they may start from one angle compared to another professor. So think about how do you learn and how should you factor that into the course you choose. Learning type, very important. Two, time commitment. Some courses are extremely thorough, extremely in-depth, and maybe it just doesn't fit with your time commitment or isn't something you can stretch out over multiple weeks. So thinking about how much time you have to commit to the class, will you have the time to go through the optional readings and the notes that come with the class to do the assignments, which often come with a lot of these classes that you audit online. What could happen to change your time commitment maybe in the next few weeks or months or a year, and how does that impact your goals for the course? Also thinking about if you've taken online courses previously, what was your time commitment then? How did that work out? And you know, adjusting it based on what your schedule's like. Because courses, again, can really vary in how much content they offer, you could have an algorithms course that does an hour on a certain topic, just straight up high level basic introduction to this topic versus another course where you have a two hour lecture, another hour of reading, and another assignment. So thinking about time commitment when choosing a course to audit is very important. Third is the institution and how the content is being delivered. And so if you're one of those individuals who maybe is interested in a certain university or you trust that this university has the best content, you're thinking about, is there an institution in mind? Um, you know, I personally think that the quality across universities is pretty normalized and wherever you go to audit a course, you're going to get great content. But if you have an institution in mind, you really should be thinking about why and should I choose that institution if they offer a course on that topic. Um, and, you know, when thinking about the content and how it's being delivered, thinking about, again, not just the lecture style or your learning style, but is the lecturer writing on a chalkboard? Are they referencing written notes? Are there PowerPoint slides? Is it audio only? Is it a video lecture with slides? Is it a video lecture without slides? Is it a professor who just goes through the Python documentation to teach you how to learn Python? A lot of courses do it differently and getting an idea of where, first where you may be interested in learning the content from, but also how the content is being delivered is super important because some people really love slides other people could not care for them anymore. So thinking three about the institution and how the content is being delivered. And so thinking about these different factors for choosing which course to audit, your learning type, your time commitment, your personal goals, what institution you wanna take it from, how the content's being delivered, that's something that can be difficult to assess if you're talking about 15, 20 courses on a topic and when you think about reviews and comments people leave, again, it can be hard to assess. And so what I recommend is taking an experimentation um, approach to evaluating these courses. So instead of having to audit 20 separate courses on one topic, you can get a sense of each one before you dive into a particular one. You can read the course description, the syllabi, any high level information about the structure and delivery of the course, learning goals, prerequisites for the course, institution and non-institution specific, and just materials to review before you take. So reading just the general description about the course and the syllabus is super important. And once you've evaluated that, another thing you can do um, if you feel comfortable with proceeding with that course and if it you know matches what you're looking for, go to the first lesson, work through the lecture material, work through any supplementary material, and kind of take note about how the material is presented, if your comprehension has improved as a result of it, um, you know, if the content is far beyond what you understand or if it's, you know, far behind what you understand and you need something more advanced or more beginner. And just thinking about, okay, after this first lesson, is this a course I'd be comfortable fully auditing through? So before you really dive into a specific course on this topic that you've chosen, think about what will make this course successful for me and what course would be the best in theory for me to take for you to learn that topic. And don't feel like because you've committed to a course that you need to follow through with it entirely 
or that you need to check out the first 10 lessons of every course before you take it, you can get a great sense of what the course is gonna offer you before you really dive in. And by doing this, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time and grief trying to learn based on a style you're not comfortable with or a time frame or a type of content or a lecturing style, whatever it is that doesn't match what you're looking for. Let's get the most out of your audit. Putting strong consideration into scheduling, accountability, and available resources will help you succeed. The most difficult part of taking an online course often isn't getting started, but rather pushing forward when the work becomes more time consuming and difficult, <laughs> just like any in-person course. Understanding your time commitment within the context of the class should help you make more effectively evaluate your schedule going forward. How can you work your audit into your schedule? If there's a time sensitive nature to learning your selected material, think about how the quality of your learning might be impacted by a quick and pace. What information do you need to know? It may make sense to prioritize some parts of a course over others. While educators and content creators often put a lot of thought into the organization and structure of their course, that doesn't always mean it's the perfect fit for you. For example, when learning from a public online course on data structures, the first few weeks might be a review of C++. If you already know C++ really well and you feel confident that you don't need to start from scratch, you can move forward and always return if necessary. While we caution against skipping material when possible, one of the biggest draws of online learning is certainly this ability to customize your learning. If you return to the earlier contemplation that led you to choose a specific topic and course, what are you hoping to get out of this course? And therefore, what schedule enables you to make the most of your learning? If you have no frame of reference for how much you'll need to study, course web pages often have times listed on them for when students attended class during the in-class offering, if applicable. You can potentially use that information to figure out what the weekly time commitment was for other students and then extrapolate on that for your needs. Everyone has slightly different levels of commitment. If you're ambitious, feel free to start strong with several hours of study a week. If possible, try to avoid overloading yourself from day one, which can lead to feeling burnt out. But at the same time, learning often and on a regular basis is a good method for success. Above all, I find that consistency is key. If you can learn a little bit every day or even every other day, even setting aside half an hour, that can lead to sustainable and impactful learning. Staying on track is hard. Don't feel bad if you miss a day. One of the easiest things that you can do though to help you meet your scheduled milestones is turn on notifications for your calendar or use a to-do list app. When your phone notifies you when it's time to learn, that's an easy way to remind yourself and keep yourself on track. I know that setting aside designated blocks of time in my calendar really helps me with following through on my audit. However, that might not work well for you. And so it is important to determine how you wanna set your pace and track your progress early on. Even if you use traditional paper and pencil, it's maybe a good idea to not just wing it. I think of self-guided learning as similar to running. When you first start, it's pretty difficult to even run a mile. But as you keep at it, it gets easier and easier, and eventually you feel as though it's a natural part of your lifestyle that you'd feel weird without doing. And also like running, you feel amazing when you're done. Online courses can be long. Breaking your chosen course down into smaller, short-term goals is another easy way to make your path feel less daunting or intimidating, and also more rewarding. If you value extrinsic validation, and you can also use short-term milestones as motivation by treating yourself when you achieve those goals. For example, you can earn as you learn by rewarding yourself with a dessert after a, a successful learning session. I enjoy watching an episode of whatever my family is currently watching at the time after meeting my goal of listening to a lecture recording for the day. And even if you set aside plenty of time daily to learn, that time is worth significantly less if you don't stay engaged. Avoid multitasking and double screening. If you're feeling bored, that's a possible indicator that this might not be the right course for you. But try to be persistent. Remember, it's impossible to fail a free online course with no grades. If you're struggling with something, take your time. Review the material and chat with other people learning online for help. 
And speaking of chatting with other online learners, that is probably one of the best ways to ensure your desired outcome of finishing the course. While you're probably fairly self-motivated and driven to even be listening to me right now, everyone can do with some peer support from time to time. Finding someone to hold you accountable is a great way to make sure you put in continuous effort. Find a friend to audit the class with you. Find someone to ask you about your progress often, or naturally put yourself into a position to get asked about your work. Try accountability study tools like ours, shout out to my guy Calix, to keep me motivated. There are also many great resources available for online learners. From Stack Overflow and GitHub Forums, if you're not familiar with those, they're basically the twin pillars holding up the entire programming community, to Reddit communities and Discord servers, there are several awesome places to seek out other learners for help and support. And if you run into any issues with a problem set, or you encounter a bug that you just can't figure out, chances are there are people who will help. There are several common pitfalls that auditors often experience, but they all ultimately lead to the same thing, not completing the course. Throughout your audit, evaluate if you notice any of these things becoming habits. Setting aside enough time for your audit can be difficult. Your time is valuable and easily filled. You'll have to decide how important your audit is to you and how to prioritize it in your schedule. Your initial plan doesn't need to be set in stone and feel free to readjust as needed to better fit your lifestyle. At the same time though, as we've discussed before, it's important to keep a measure of consistency. If you're feeling overwhelmed or dealing with difficult material, take a break and ask for help. When you set aside half an hour to learn, Consider putting your phone on do not disturb or the equivalent. If you're spending your allotted studying time responding to texts or browsing Twitter, that doesn't really count. I can, you know, I've done it too. <laughs> it's relatively common midway through a course to lose energy or focus. While it's healthy to take a break, if it's important to you that you cover all the course material, make sure to set a date to return to your learning in advance so it doesn't become an overextended hiatus where you begin to forget important information. Not engaging with other online learners is another common trap. There is a thriving community surrounding online education. Take advantage of it. You're welcome to join forums and ask for feedback and advice. And I really wanna emphasize this. Don't be afraid to ask for help. You should not contact the creator of the course unless they explicitly say you can. And I, I say that from experience. You should also search the web for your question first. But if you don't find a relevant answer, other learners in online communities will be happy to help. Even if you're confident in your understanding of the material, finding social support and community with other people learning on the web, even if you're focusing on different topics, can be beneficial for your mental health and make you feel more engaged. One of the main differences between auditing a course online and taking it at an accredited institution, but besides receiving official credit for it, of course, is the personal support that you receive from teachers, teachers' assistants, peer mentors, and friends. If you can find other online learners that fill some of those roles, it may improve your experience. You may not find anyone, and interacting with people over the web can always involve some level of risk, but it might be worth a shot. Finally, although I encouraged you to set your own pace before, I'd also warn against flying through material. Watching lectures at two times speed will mean that they'll be over faster, but your understanding and retention of the material might be hampered too. Skipping material can also be fine if you're really confident you know it already, but sometimes it's nice to review things. You're choosing to spend your time learning this, so I again encourage you to find value in the process of learning just as much of the end goal of gaining this knowledge. If your goal from the outside is to thoroughly cover all the material in your course, consider keeping these pitfalls in mind as you learn. You can also enrich your learning through complementary resources. Often, educators will link to relevant complementary material for your use, from public textbooks like those linked on the College Compendium textbooks page, to YouTube series, to other free CodeCamp courses and articles. You can expand far beyond the extent of the resources provided in the course you're currently auditing. You can even dive into academic papers with sites like Papers with Code, an amazing resource for anyone looking to improve their understanding of cutting edge technologies. If you're auditing a course on the web, chances are there will exist an answer to any question you encounter. Whether you're in need of clarifying explanation or you're curious about the deeper workings of a subject, 
there will be something or someone able to help. All of this is to say that there's a lot of actions that you can take to improve your auditing experience and make the most of your time. We encourage you to do so. <laughs> you've audited a course, what next? Before moving on, ensure you've fully reviewed the material and understand everything of importance. There's little point to doing this if you walk away without a strong comprehension of the content. At this point, you've completed your course. Have you reached your goals? Do you have all the skills you'll need for that project you wanted to build or an internship or a position that you've been aiming for? Either way, congratulations. Finishing a course is an incredibly impressive achievement and you should feel amazing. Be proud of yourself. A successful audit demonstrates strong motivation and effort, but there's always more to learn. Your online education is never finished. The question is simply about how to proceed in the short term. If you're looking to learn a specific skill set like machine learning and data science, chances are one course won't be enough. Therefore, sequencing courses to effectively audit an unofficial degree can be incredibly useful. There are many, many resources on the web where people have compiled courses to create pathways for becoming highly skilled through successive auditing. For example, starting with a high-level math and introductory Python course, then learning data structures, then learning an overview of neural networks, and then a more specific course on generative adversarial networks. In other words, following a trajectory similar to a real curriculum, where you start with foundations of a topic and build on those, gradually becoming more specific. Another incredibly valuable part of auditing public courses on the web is the ability to mix and match courses from various sources. You can learn one topic from a school like MIT, then the next from a university such as Harvard, and then the next from a college like Berkeley. This ability to interchange your learning allows you to pick the classes that appeal the most to you potentially creating a learning experience worth more than the sum of its parts. Math is fundamental to programming, especially so for data science. If you're looking to audit computer science, it's also worth considering adding classes covering concepts in statistics, calculus, linear algebra, and discrete math to your custom curriculum. These courses will provide a stronger foundation for your understanding of key concepts in computer science, such as algorithms and data structures. Before I wrap this section up, I wanted to give a shout out to the GitHub Student Developer Pack. If you're a student enrolled in any educational institution, then this is a no-brainer bundle of free resources for programming, including free domains, hosting, and the pro versions of JetBrains IDEs. Freedom is a central theme of online self-guided learning. Choose your own content based on your interests. Choose your learning format, your teacher, and the source of your class. Choose your schedule. Choose what you learn next. It's all up to you. With the knowledge that you've gained in this video, you're informed to make these decisions and achieve your goals through auditing. Up next, we have a few examples where we audited real courses, vlog style, based on the information discussed in this course. Okay. One way that I learn is through examples. And so in the spirit of learning through examples, Seth and I are going to take you through an example of what we just talked about, summarizing all of it. Essentially thinking about a topic, thinking about a course to take, evaluating it, and ultimately auditing it. So let's get started. For me, um, recently I've been doing two things. I've been working on coding interviews and I have been working on personal projects. And doing both of those things has taught me something about myself. And that's that I am really bad at solving problems in a computationally uh, efficient manner. I found that out with a lot of coding interviews and also with just side projects I work on, I'm usually solving things in a very belabored manner, I could probably consolidate that down. In addition to kind of what I've been doing, in a few terms, I have an algorithms course um, that I'm going to be taking that I'm super excited for, but I also don't really know much about algorithms. And I have a feeling that maybe taking an algorithms course will not only prepare me for what I'll be taking in the future, but also like for now may help me with like coding interviews and understanding time complexity, um, memory, and just like computational intensity. 
So I think, and I haven't taken an algorithms course before, so I think I'm going to take an algorithms course. Um, and, you know, I have classes that start pretty soon, so I don't have a lot of time, probably a week. And I think I'm just going to spend like an hour or two a day watching lectures, maybe taking notes and just getting a sense of what I'm in for. Maybe it'll solve my uh, coding interview woes in the short term and long term. I'll be prepared for my algorithms course. So lucky for me, there's a few um, algorithms courses, quite a few, because it's um, really the core part of a lot of computer science curriculums. So when I go to College Compendium, I'm just going to search for algorithms in the top right and, you know, see which courses I can come across. And you can already see there are so many. Um, a Waterloo Design and Analysis of Algorithms course. There's an MIT Design and Analysis. U Toronto, Washington. It looks like some of these courses are pretty advanced and I'm very far from being <laughs> advanced when it comes to algorithms. So I think I'm going to look for a course that isn't too advanced. Um, so looking through these, okay, MIT, Fall 2011, an introduction to algorithms course. I don't think algorithms change like that often, so maybe Fall 2011 that will work. It says uh, this course provides an introduction to mathematical modeling of computational problems. It covers common algorithms, algorithmic paradigms, and data structures used to solve these problems pretty straightforward. I'm personally a fan of MIT OpenCourseWare. They never really miss when it comes to these courses, so, and they have video lectures, so I, I think this could be a good course to take. So I'm just gonna open this in a new tab, and I'm actually just gonna look at the syllabus and get a sense of the prerequisites and what the time frame was when people were taking this course, when it was recorded. So it looks like two sessions a week, one hour a session. Okay, that's good. I can, you know, do one hour lecture sessions. Also recitations, two sessions a week, one hour a session. So it seems like there's a bit of supplementary material when it comes to um, learning in this algorithms course. Um, let's see, prerequisites, a firm grasp on Python. I don't know if firm is the right word, but I, I know Python. A solid background and discrete, again, Solid. I don't know about that, but I've, t I've taken a discrete mathematics course. And um, look, they even link to courses, Introduction to Eeks and Mathematics for Computer Science. So um, I think that I have covered those areas sufficiently. So this is perfect based on my prerequisites. Um, they also are linking a book, a textbook to buy Introduction to Algorithms and another one that uses Python. Okay. Um, Lectures and recitations, you're responsible for material presented in lectures, including oral comments. Okay, problem sets, um, seven problem sets during the course of the semester, so I go once every two weeks. Quizzes, grading policy, great. So that seems doable, and you can see um, unit one, algorithmic thinking, peak finding, models of computation, Python cost model, document distance, and problem set one that corresponds to that. So, you know, that's five lectures right there, an hour each, and a problem set. I think that could be a good start for understanding um, the lectures. And you can see the problem set one PDF is here, the codes here, and oh, it even has the uh, solutions, which is gonna be super helpful. And yeah, this, this definitely looks doable. So this looks like a great course for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to watch the first lecture video and see if it's doable, if I understand the content, and then go from there, maybe even start on problem set one. And I will see you then. Great, so I just finished watching the first lecture and I found it to be pretty much in line with where I'm at, um, with my understanding. In fact, the first like 10 minutes or so, the professor reviewed like what is to come in the course, which I found to be super helpful and clarifying um, just going forward with like a future material. And I took some notes here and I actually, I looked at the lecture notes that are corresponding to the lecture. Um, and it's interesting because it's really a consolidated version of the one hour lecture. So I may just end up looking at these um, for like doing problem sets and stuff. But yeah, you know, at a cursory glance, looking at the first lecture, it seems like this is a course that I can, you know, get a few, 
get a get, get a few lessons out of um, and I can follow along with the content. I don't find it too fast or too slow. And I feel like, you know, now he's actually solving one of the problems uh, that I saw in an interview. So it looks like this is going to be a good course for the purpose that I'm looking for. And it seems doable over the next week. So I'm ready to audit this course. I think it's going to be great. And I'm excited to see where it goes. Well, I hope you enjoyed Sam sort of informally giving you his thought process behind using the things we've discussed in this video to choose a course. I'm going to try and do the same, but as I already watched the first few lectures, I'm going to offer a more retrospective approach. So I chose to audit a data structures course, and I really want to learn the logic behind a lot of the abstractions that I use in programming. I've heard of these concepts, linked lists, tree and graph traversal, and even different methods of sorting, um, but I don't really have a strong understanding of them. And I know that understanding data structures is really critical to being able to make decisions as a programmer. So the course that I picked is CS61B Data Structures from Berkeley. Um, and I found it through College Compendium just by searching for data structures on the website. And this course is special because it has an enrollment of 1,600 students. And so what that means is that the court is designed in a way that doesn't require much teacher interaction. And the teacher themselves explains this in the first lecture. Like if they give every kid a minute of the time, it would take more than a day. And so in addition to that, it's also very recent. Um, it was made in spring of 2021. And so the material is relatively new. And it's very nice because it is links to every lecture slides and thorough notes outlining all of the important information in the videos as well as acting as guides for what I need to do next. Most of the code is available freely on GitHub and they have crazy in-depth resources with guides, documentation, review material, and so on. And so not all courses are created equal for auditing publicly on the web. And I do encourage you to make sure that the course you choose has everything you want before you start it. But another part of why this course was a good fit for me was because it's very heavily lab and project-based. So I really enjoy projects as a method for learning um, because it gives me something to work towards and it's, it's just more fun. Building 2048 was uh, the first project for this class. I'm excited to see what the ones to follow involve. So this course started with a review of Java and this was good because I haven't really used Java much since AP Computer Science A going over syntax and static typing, but it also goes over things like Git, the programming version control tool. And I can safely skip Git because I've even made resources teaching Git, such as ultimate Git resource available on GitHub. And what I wanna say here as well is that if you know uh, any concept well enough to teach it, then that's a really good way to ensure that you understand it. It's also just a good method for going over your material and potentially even helping other people to learn it as well. The last thing I want to touch on before passing it back to Sam is that when I first looked at this course, it's 16 weeks long, it can be a little bit intimidating. You know, all of the material that I have to cover, in addition to being a full-time student and having projects and research and so on. And so something that I like to do is compartmentalize my approach for auditing. And so I'm gonna just do just this lecture this week or just this assignment. And I don't know if that will necessarily be the most helpful thing for you, but it's something to consider. Regardless, I'm really excited to continue auditing this course and I hope you're excited to begin yours. So thank you so much for watching. Um, really appreciate it. If you found it helpful, let us know. If you have any questions, please comment down below and we will make sure to answer. And if there's one note that I wanna leave off on, as long as you are taking the initiative to find a course because you enjoy a topic or you wanna learn it and you're listening to lectures and reading notes and doing assignments, that's good enough. And so don't be discouraged if you don't finish a course or you leave it early 
because really it's about learning and getting comfortable with learning in what is a very uncomfortable way to learn. What matters is that you're learning and you're taking the initiative and you're bettering yourself in the process. Thank you for listening to our course. We hope that you come away feeling prepared and excited to learn by auditing courses on the web. If you're not sure where to start, try searching for your topic of interest on collegecompendium.org, where we've curated hundreds of resources on all manner of popular programming areas. Or search Free Code Camp. Thank you again to Quincy Larson from Free Code Camp for supporting this course. That's all, folks. Good luck.